Well, none of none of us here have ever lived in a really nice house by those standards. No, my house is and we're poorly framed. And we're mine's <laughs> poorly built. Mine's totally poorly insulated. I'm still not sure that that bird oh, yeah. that came in didn't come through the sheathing. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Justin Fink. I'll be your host. I'm joined by the usual guys, Brian Pontalillo and Rob Yeager. Say hi, guys. Hey. 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 Oh, man. I, <laughs> for, for everyone listening. I was just having a little trouble with the... Uh, yeah, case of the giggles. <laughs> Justin had the case we of the giggles. Had a few too many jokes before the, before the mics heated up over here. And uh, I was having trouble keeping a straight face during uh, the intro there. That was... that was uh, It took many tries to get to what you just heard, folks. So if I just start laughing in the middle of the show for no reason, it might mean that I need more sleep. I don't know. Um, so today we're going to... We got a little bit of feedback. We're, uh, we're going to talk about the, the margarine phase of building. We're going to talk about yes. uh, vermiculite insulation, and we're going to talk about uh, 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 a mystery mystery plumbing component. Mm. Um, All good stuff. And uh, if you're joining us uh, for the video version of this podcast, we're going to have some some video some some slides up behind us in the TV, courtesy of of our, our, our stellar producer Jeff. And um, you'll also be able to find any of these visuals and other show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can also send us emails at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. FH, but what is it? You got it. Is it the first one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fhbpodcast at taunton.com. At taunton.com. T a u n t o n dot com. Killed it, Brian. Dot nice com. job. <laughs> nice job. Okay, you guys. Um, we got some. We got some huge news this week. Huge news. Oh. Rob is now. Working on a new project. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about some other huge news. What was the other huge news? Um, Do we have other huge news? Yeah, we're giving a boatload of money away to some some kids. Oh, I don't have that. Uh, Do you want to read stuff. that? Um, I don't have that written down for you, for myself here. <laughs> oh, you don't? Oh, yeah. Um, June 21st uh, at the Skills USA National Convention. For those who have been listening or following along on our social media channels and uh, FindHomeBuilding.com and the Keep Craft Alive campaign, we've partnered with Certainty and Skills USA to give away five scholarships for um, some young men and women who are interested in pursuing careers in the trades. And so we're going to give our first round of $5,000 scholarships away June 21st. Yeah. In awesome. Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. Super cool. So you're going to Kentucky <clears throat> to, to give it away? To, I'm going to Kentucky. For those who know a little bit about Skills USA, it's their national call it national skills and leadership conference so um people who are members of skills usa high school kids votech students they compete um year-round regionally and if they win their given event so they've got competitions in a bunch of different categories carpentry masonry electrical i mean it kind of spreads a bunch of industries but um they've got a chance to compete in regionals and then eventually if they're good enough they compete in nationals, and so they'll be competing there, and we're going to have a small event um, giving out these uh, scholarships, which is super cool. And are this, The scholarships are or aren't tied to the competition? No. So in order to um, – we had a, a, an application process independent mm-hmm. of their – I guess their skill set, so to, so, okay. to, so, so to speak. I mean um, – they had to demonstrate that they were really committed to this type of work, mm-hmm. but uh, they had to write an essay about what craftsmanship means to them mm. and then also provide supporting uh, documentation from like a, a mentor or an advisor, yeah, a letter cool. of support. And so Andy Angle, senior editor, and I went through um, a bunch of applications um, and there's some good ones yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was like there's, yeah. there's like uh, sort of the hard luck stories mixed in there. Yeah. It's really kind of Absolutely. like, whoa, this is there's some real struggle people are overcoming to – because they want to do this. And uh, definitely worth mentioning that thank you to those who bought a Keep Craft Alive scholar or T-shirt because those um, profits went to supporting these scholarships as well. So, Do we still have more of those T-shirts do. for sale? Yeah. So if you want to find out more about um, the campaign, if you want to buy a Keep Craft Alive T-shirt, you go to keepcraftalive.org. I love those shirts. They're great shirts. Yeah. American made. How do you not have one? I think I thought I gave you one. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> because we took, cause we, took, we took the T-shirts that we had left 
and we moved them to our distribution center in Iowa so that we could sell them to uh, uh, our audience. Yeah. Do you want me to buy you one, Brian? Yeah. That'd be great. What size are you? I got a sticker on my truck. I saw that. Yeah. You, you love stickers in that truck. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed that too. I was like, wow. I walked out and I was like, Brian's going for the stickers. Yeah. Oh, he's always done that. Every yeah, car he has. He's got the whole left little panel yeah, I try to loaded hold on up there. And I always, someone gives me, so Aaron gave me a sticker in this case. Someone gives you one and then it's just like, all right, you put it on and then. Yeah. And then, and then stickers are just everywhere. Yeah, you got a good yeah. variety. Yeah. Nice. Keep Craft Live is my favorite. That's what do good. you, what do you, why do you like the stickers on the truck? Not that I like them. I just, I don't know. I are you like, saying something know. with your sticker collage yeah. there? It, I don't feel like you are. There's no, there's no clear message. That's for sure. Yeah, that's why I'm curious <laughs> to know what your reasoning is. It's just that somebody gave you a. St- so if anybody yeah. has any stickers, yes, yeah, send them my way. Send them to send them to us. Uh, if you shoot us an email, we'll give you the address, and yep. and uh, Brian will proudly put it on his truck. I we'll know t- a lot of people out in the community have stickers. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of sticker trading on Instagram. We will take a picture of that sticker on Brian's truck and then post it to our feeds. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. are a few things with that Brian I, there are a few Brian things that I will not put on there. So if you don't see your sticker on my truck. You'll know how I feel about certain things. Oh, okay. Interesting. Oh. Well, I, I would hope it would be like building type stickers, you know, like yes. building companies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Tyler Grace. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he has stickers. Oh, He's come on. nice shirts. How could he not have stickers? I don't, I don't have one of those either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got a, a shirt you, from Tyler either. Did you get a shirt from uh, Matt Reiser? I did. Thank you, Matt. Those if you're listening. Yeah. Matt Reiser, your shirts are sweet. Solid shirt. Can you yeah. get those from his website? Because he's got a sweet design on those things. I don't know if he sells them. Matt Reisinger, go to his website and, and yeah. send him an email and tell him you want him to start selling shirts because yeah. I felt pretty cool. I, I was wearing that. I, I got off the motorcycle with like the like the jacket unzipped and it had like the Matt Reisinger shirt. I'm like, come yeah. on. People are like, people are like, what's that sweet logo? And you're like, you don't even know what this is. You're not up on the cool. This is the Risinger. Uh, oh, but the other huge news, in addition to T-shirts and Keepcraft Live scholarships, sure. yes, back is, to the big news, is that Rob has dusted off his uh, his Bucket Boss tool belt, and he's he's back. <laughs> I didn't wear the Bucket Boss, and he's back. Uh, He's back up uh, breaking stuff down. Breaking stuff down. Deconstructing things. Jeff, I think we do we have a picture of that we can throw up, but check check the <clears> um the file I sent you. Uh, we have a panoramic shot that Rob has taken. The um, one photo might, that I took. You might need to refresh it. Um uh he I, I haven't I, seen it yet. Um I haven't sent it to you. And no. uh you You're sent not. it to me and Colin, but okay. it's looking good, Brian. We're going to put it up on the screen so you can check it out, Brian, right. as I, well as everyone else. I love the fact that John, that uh, Justin says it's looking good. And probably to the average person, they're like, "Oh my God, what a nightmare! Mm. What did you do?" Oh, I think it's so buttoned up and neat and clean. And well, and, it's getting uh, there. Yeah, um, it's demo phase. So, but, it's it, but little, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the overall little, scope is for people who don't know what you're playing? It's a little, it's a little raw. Um, yeah, we've got it up on the screen right now. Um, so, I live as um, I may have mentioned, I live like in a 1940s Cape, um, and. Uh, the upstairs of the cave only had one finished bedroom. And you could see that um, in the photo at the top of the stairs, you would kind of bang a hard right and you would go into <laughs> hard right. Um, or you just turn to the right. No, it's a hard right. Okay. Extremely hard. And you have to bang it. Yeah. Um, and so there was a finished bedroom up there that we didn't really use too, too much. It was more of a guest space. And then the other, I guess, three quarters of the upstairs was just open attic space, which was largely empty. It's also... Um, part of the reason why we bought the house in the first place because I walked up during an open house and I saw all that space that could be occupied. Um, So talking about like improve the real estate value, it was like, okay, I don't have to add an addition. I could just kind of finish this this area out. It's uh, it's it's surprisingly large. I showed this photo to somebody else. We were having a conversation. They're like, "That's a cape." I yeah, said, yeah. It's really it, it's kind of strange in that a cape. I think conventionally you come in the front door and you're met with those um, the stairs to the second floor. Mm-hmm. And so, like when you're thinking about layouts, like there's a conventional second floor cape layout, right? Like bedroom you, on either side, yeah, bathroom you, in front of you, yeah, <laughs> bathroom on, uh, opposing the stairs. Um, and you could either maybe he get two bedrooms to the right, front and back of the house, and then maybe a bassa bedroom to the left, which would span the entire width. It's my brother's Perfect. house. Perfect. Complicated on this project is because the ha- the stairs for some reason are pushed towards the back of the house, and then there's kind of a it's not a central chimney, but there's a chimney um, coming up, kind of like in the middle of the floor plan, which makes for some interesting uh, layout options. Is that is that <clears throat> area that was all looks like it's spray painted? Is that pink? Like the chimney no, it's and the wall. Oh, so that's the thing. Yeah. For whatever reason, um, that attic was, yeah, it was, it was completely sprayed a light pink. Mm. 
So I like it's it. beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful in there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. You gotta keep that, right? I don't know. Just put a clear coat oh, over yeah, it. Yeah, totally. I'm gonna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're incorporating that chimney in the design somehow, right? No, I'm gonna cover that up. <sighs> Everyone says that. Hold on, my heart's breaking. Yeah. <sighs> no, covering it right up. Why? It's um, so nice looking. It's not really that nice looking. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. <laughs> not that nice looking. Nice. But anyway, um, so uh, last Friday. Wow, I don't even... Let's start a campaign. Everybody check out this photo and send us an email if Rob should keep the chimney. Vote, <laughs> d- text 112 <laughs> if you think Rob should keep the chimney. So um, last Friday, I spent the day gutting um, the upstairs, getting rid of the bedroom, and um, I had some stuff. I, sh- I showed just the big win for me was I had a couple, or there were a couple old cast iron radiators up in the attic that were scary heavy. They were like four feet long, and I was like, I don't know, like I, I could barely move them. They were installed up there. Or no, stored they were up just there. stored up okay. there, and I had never moved them. We've lived in the house for four years, five mm-hmm. years now, and I never moved them because I couldn't really move them. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get these things apart because uh, some radiators they've got like this long through bolt that hold yeah. these sections together. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to break that nut loose. I don't know how long they've been up here, but fortunately, they were able to come apart, and I could just bring them down to the truck in pieces. And I was like. Whew. What are you going to do with Dodge that? Dodge that bullet. Use them for tarp weights or something? I'll be bringing them to the dump. All right. So Nothing cool ever happens over there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I just demoed the place. Um, took down the ceiling, tried to figure out what was going on. You could see in the photo some really sketchy uh, kind of framing in the roof or in the ceiling and the rafter ties there that are cobbled together two by material. Um, I was hoping to find – not that I was hoping to find – I was hoping to find like a big – stack of cash from the former owner who was pretty thrifty. <laughs> well, hold on a second. Rafter ties don't necessarily need to be anything. I think it can be a one by. Rafter ties don't have to be beefy. I think it's... they need to be two by four minimum. Really? I think so. I thought, I thought you could go away with one by. Um, we're going to get hassled by people who are going to say we should those... do 20 minutes of research on Google before we get the show. We'll get to that later in a little <laughs> but bit. Those aren't rafter ties, are they? Well, so this is what's funny. They're rafter ties on the back of the house because they come off the top of the uh, shed dormer um, uh-huh. They come off the plate. They come off the plate, right? Oh, sorry, and then you're right. Their collar ties in the front one, and they're like the top third of That's the. That's right. Yeah, I misspoke. Yeah. I was <laughs> I was looking at collar ties. Yeah. Um, so I kind of took that down. I didn't discover. I discovered some. I actually knew this is uh, the venting. I was telling Brian was pretty hysterical. I've got <laughs> those um, foam vent uh, baffles. Oh yeah. Along, along uh, the eave there, and there's no soffit intake. So I don't know why they put them there. <laughs> um, and then also, as I peeled back that um, the drywall and the knee wall, they also had baffles coming off um, the knee wall going up above the attic, I guess, plane. Mm-hmm. Just in case you wanted to add Just venting. in case, yeah. Um, so that was interesting. The other interesting th- uh, discovery was in this bedroom near the uh, stairwell there, I had discovered a, a real kind of, well, like a wet spot in the ceiling. And I was like, oh, sweet. I got a roof leak here. Um, knowing that I was going to do the work, I didn't really address it, put a bucket beneath it. Um, and it wasn't really dripping. <laughs> knowing they that you're just, going to be re Yeah, and tearing yeah. into it. And so when I tore into it, I got to that section, and there wasn't a roof leak. Um, there was the main uh, plumbing vent that kind of goes up in that area. And uh, somebody, they hadn't glued it. So um, right at an elbow, the run of plumbing pipe kind of just came apart. And so any moisture that found its way into the roof vent through the roof kind of drained back yeah, and dripping right yeah. into the bedroom. Yeah. Here's the other thing, though. It had been, rep- it had been repaired before. There was a little kind of scrap of wood backer, you know, like you would fasten like a chunk of drywall to mm-hmm. um, to make that patch. But they didn't fix the, didn't fix the problem. <laughs> I wonder if that patch was where they were doing something that caused the problem. Maybe. Good point. And they didn't fix it. Yeah. Right. Mm. Good point. So cleaned uh, most of it up, got all the drywall out. Um, I realized immediately like I'm a pretty cheap and thrifty kind of dude because I was going to try to do all this demo and just throw it in the back of my truck and start like hauling stuff to the to the dump. And Patrick McComb, who's been on the show before, was like, dude, you just got to get a dumpster. And it was the best thing oh, that yeah. I ever did. You oh, know? Yeah. I didn't have to build See, a chute. Go back to episode one. Yeah. Talking about dumpsters then. Yeah. I didn't have to build a chute. I think we, we may have talked about that when I was planning to do this work. Yeah. But, um, they were able to drop it beneath a window 
Um, so I could just huck the stuff out there and then run down and kind of reorganize and really jam pack that six yard dumpster full. Mm -hmm. Is it already get picked up? Oh yeah, totally. I filled it by like two, three o'clock on Friday and they picked it up at seven thirty Saturday morning. Wow. You only had it for a day? Yeah. Um, you didn't get a big enough dumpster. And then uh it should take about a week to fill up if you're doing it right. <laughs> and then I um and then I started laying a new subfloor that well that's what you can see on the right side of the image. Um, you know, the the subfloor that's up there is like uh it's really it's not beat up, it's just kind of wonky framing, you know. Um so to to even things out and to tighten things up a little bit, um, I just put new three quarter inch OSB TNG subfloor on. You brought that stuff up the yeah. stairs to the house. That's fun. It was threading the needle mm -hmm. through some of those doorways. I had to like you know walk through the walk through the kitchen into the dining room. Yeah, you kind of back do up. This oh yeah, to totally. <sighs> Did you yeah. have the ceiling of, of the a stairwell? Little bit. You always got to nick no, that spot. No, not, not, the, not the ceiling, the stairwell, uh, the head casing in the in the doorway oh, below. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, so what, you glue and screw this stuff down? It's TNG three-quarter? Didn't, didn't glue it, just screwed it. Left the, what I have to do is I've got to figure out some plumbing for the bathroom. So I, it's all it's all complete now, but I left those kind of pieces out. So and, is it in plane with the, yeah. the finished floor? So yeah. you're going to end up, you're going to cover it all eventually. Yep, I'm going to cover it all. Yeah. Likely carpet in the bedrooms um and then maybe some hardwood like in the hallway area so what's phase two phase two is i've got some um i'm so excited we're, we're moving now. yeah that's it so oh the other thing um worth mentioning is uh the uh rafter slash collar ties that you're seeing in the photo right now will be replaced because um they're at seven six right now i think I don't know exactly. Seven foot six? Yeah. I don't know exa their exact dimension, but I'll, I'll create a full um, eight foot tall ceiling in there. Right. So I'll raise those once the new rafter ties are in, then I'll remove those. Um, so next up is figuring out um, the exact location of the um, of the dormer. So, so that's the, obviously that's the front of the, of the house that you're seeing on an image and there's going to be three dormers going. Um, in there, and we've talked about that in a couple episodes now Talk about, about that. getting those right. And yeah, cool. So next week we're gonna check back with you, see what we got. Yeah, we, we'll, hopefully we'll have some framing progress. Sweet. Yeah, I gotta spin over there, check it out. You do. Um, I also, um, you know, I've got a I've got a floor plan here that I presented like when I got my permit and everything. I just had a kind of overly detailed uh, permit set and plan set. Um, but I also have like a couple different scenarios mm. that I could that I could go. I kind of want to see once those dormers are in if I want to modify anything. Um, oh yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, now that you have it gutted, that everything's out the window. You're gonna yeah. stand there and go, "This bathroom feels too small." Yeah. Well, that's so, so. So that's a good point because that's the biggest thing that my wife and I are struggling with right now is that we have the opportunity to um, get uh, maybe an additional small bedroom up there, and so. It's like this space that it, it can't really, because of the chimney and the layout and where the bathroom is going to be, it could be a huge walk-in closet for the master bedroom, which kind of seems excessive for us. Um, it could be just a attic space, which, okay, I guess people could use more storage, but we also have a bunch of storage in our basement, so like, we don't need it. Um, or it could be a bedroom. And so a quick, uh, I guess a question for you guys is like, how small is too small for a bedroom? What are the dimensions that you have? It's got to be nine feet by 12-ish. Mm. That's pretty tight, dude. Can you get in there? There'd be a closet? I could, I could get a closet in there. I could get a I could get a bed in there, of course. Yeah. Um, like a small twin bed. Yeah. yeah. Storage built below. It's a nursery, nursery and small kids' bedroom. I mean, I grew up in a really small bedroom. So did I. And I I'm like, taking like the Frank Lloyd Wright approach of like you know just make those bedrooms super small. <laughs> well, I like listen, I'm really sophisticated I like, the like that. Idea. You like to walk in the closet because think about. I think people are not even even if it's you and Kyle you yeah. just living there, and you say you don't feel like you need that, but that allows your your bedroom to just be really. You don't need to put furniture. So much, so much furniture. You don't true. need dressers and things. That's true. And true. Make your bedroom really nice and free it up to have other kinds of. You know, maybe you put some furniture, furniture that's just for sitting and reading in your bedroom instead of having a 
chest of drawers for clothes. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. Okay. I think I think that purposeful, useful storage spaces really are what allows other other spaces, the living spaces, to feel great. Mm -hmm. You know, when when you when you look at homes that that appear to be very uncluttered, to be appear to be very spacious and um, usually the reason that they're able to be that way isn't because the homeowners are minimalists or meticulous. It's because they have these dedicated storage spaces, places for everything somewhere else. Yeah, they true. have the right closets for their things or they have the mud room that keeps things out yeah. of the family room or the kitchen entryway. And Justin's getting dressed. Here, Justin. Taking my shirt off <laughs> and everyone can see it. So I'm, I, I'm voting for the walk-in closet. Okay, Justin, your thoughts. It's hot in here. <laughs> That's surprising from the minimalist of the of the group. This is but, your, your house, not mine. Uh, I'm like three <laughs> degrees <laughs> off from, from from your lifestyle. Um, um, I think I agree with you. I, I agree with that um, in that, yeah, if you've got dedicated spaces, I'm always, we talked about this, small home design, design it like a ship, have a functional and a purposeful space for everything. Yeah. So it kind of disappear and you're not well, managing it. So are we talking about the difference between uh, – Three bedrooms and two bedrooms? Yeah. So including the master. Yeah, so there's a potential. But you still have the downstairs bedroom. So there's potential yeah. to have three bedrooms on the second floor. I mean, come on. And a guest bedroom downstairs. Question is, we don't have kids yet. If there were kids in the picture, do we want to be upstairs with one kid downstairs? Bunk you're, beds. You're the parent of the... Oh, you're the, you're the parent. You just run them all down there. <laughs> Trying to make the whole thing a master suite. Kids all in one bedroom downstairs. Yeah. Done. But you got your son living on the first floor, right? I mean, he's older, so he he lived on the same floor as us. I mean, you know, our house is very yeah. small, but he lived on the same floor as us for a while. Now he's a teenager and he's downstairs, yeah. and it's much better. Making his <laughs> making, his, <laughs> making his beats down there. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if there's a way for me to design this and construct the partitions in a way where there's some flexibility. Like I can make it a master yeah. closet if I want to, but very easily could be modified and changed if for whatever reason sure someone wanted it someone to wanted different. to if we wanted to or for somebody else wanted to. I, yeah i'm a huge fan of always designing things so that you have options later i was thinking about this when i was snaking wires in my house last week and i in order to go from my porch where i put new lights in i had to go from the porch into the attic all the way across the attic down from the attic to the basement across the basement, and then back up four feet to the wall right next to the porch because mm. <laughs> there's no other way to get there. Mm. Nice. And so I, as I was doing this, I was like, man, when I build a house, I'm just going to put like a 12-inch wide duct <laughs> just running right to the center. Just, That's cool, yeah. Just, you know. Yeah. Um, I also identified some some air leaks that I did not realize that I had while I was doing this, you know. I was trying to find spots where I could, I don't mean to get us off track. I was trying to find spots where I could easily get from the attic all the way to the basement. So I found a, a plumbing vent pipe, which runs all the way from the basement up. And I was like, oh, I'll just go right in the space. And it's a little slightly oversized hole this vent pipe is going through. I'll just kind of piggyback on there. And then as I'm going through, I'm like, wait, why is this open? <laughs> why, why is there a big <laughs> hole going from my basement to my attic? But mm. um, if you could find some ways to creatively design for for flexibility, uh, whether that means uh, roughing out, e even roughing out where the door would be, like framing right. framing the door opening mm -hmm. so that if you wanted to cut away the drywall, then just cut away the bottom plate and tip a door in, you're, you're connected. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something as simple as that, making sure you don't have an outlet there that you later have to move or wire running through to an outlet that is going to be in mm -hmm. your way later. Um, there's also uh, situations where if you think there's pieces of wood you're going to have to remove, maybe you screw them in. Instead of right. gluing and nailing them, uh, um, making sure that your transitions and the floor height and everything are going to be, I don't know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of thinking if you had to do it, if you plan on doing it later, what would it have to be? Uh, what would it have to involve? But the the other thing, I was just drew a blank on what the second thing I was going to say was. Uh, that's gone. <laughs> so, so do that also. Way. I'll do that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, maybe next week we'll have some progress picks and mm. an update. Yeah. All right. What was I going to say? Ah, damn it. Uh, so you guys want to read this, some feedback here? We got uh, from Kurt. 
I'm a remodel carpenter, but I've never built a complete house from the ground up. I'm working on being able to build my own house in the next couple of years. That said, the more I learn about insulation and air sealing, the less I think I know or understand it. There's got to be a better wall assembly that's not expensive, full of toxic foams, and relatively simple. Just when it seems like there is, I hear or read stories about mold due to not enough insulation or too much or in the wrong place, bad air sealing, drying to inside, drying to outside, insulation on both the inside and outside. All this scares me to think I know just enough to be dangerous. Kurt, you're probably right. Uh, I've worked on a lot of old houses, and although they all have their own issues, they don't lead to mold, and they don't need mechanical ventilation systems to keep occupants from asphyxiating. But if... What? Keep going. <laughs> Are you guys looking at each other and laughing? But of course, they tend to be woefully under-insulated, like our current 1947 house, and I'm wondering if there's a happy medium. My girlfriend, who's a farmer, not a builder, came up with this margarine comparison which she mentions when I talk to her about the theories of building. To her, it seems like building is in a similar period as when people's health suffered due to marketers convincing them that man-made margarine was better than butter and baby formula was better than breast milk. So what is the big picture here? Is it about greener houses? What does that mean? Do they, use le do they consume less carbon? Am I right, Brian? We, emit, emit. Emit less carbon? carbon Sorry, we're, we're fixing a type, typo on the fly here. If I can build a smaller house that has walls... An engineer would scoff at because there are value, but the house uses less energy than a leader passive house. Who really built the best house? Etc. So, what do you guys think? There's a lot here. There's, There's a, a lot, lot here. There. We've often talked, uh, both on the show and privately, about how we are in a um, in a period of time where there is not really a standard wall assembly anymore. It used to be for a long time, two by fours, fiberglass bats plywood or OSB sheathing, fiberglass, I mean, uh, house wrap on the outside, good to go. Whatever climate you're in, good to go. It's not really true, but that's what everyone was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, vapor, vapor barrier on the inside, I forgot that part. Uh, now everybody is taking all these parts and pieces and rearranging them and coming up with new and innovative and creative solutions, and there's, um, there's an influx of products that didn't used to be conventionally available that people are now finding more easily because of the internet and... Uh, there's uh, high-end building suppliers that you can have ship products right to your house and somehow maybe you can European air sealing tapes and things that were not available largely before from the local brick and mortar. So the, the kind of the restrictors have been taken off completely and, and now it's like pedal to the metal. We're going in 47,000 different directions on how to build houses. And I think it's right to stop every once in a while and go, are we really making anything better here? Or are we just making it more complicated and dangerous? And I think what he's um, honing in on when it comes to are we making things better is energy and energy consumption. Mm -hmm. And then he's scratching out the embodied energy of some of the products and materials we're using to gain performance out of our houses. And for anybody who doesn't know what embodied energy is, just real quickly, it's it's like the what energy is, it took to, to produce that product, Yeah, right? so, so what is the energy that takes to, to produce a sheet of rigid foam? and transport it to the site. Like, like the example, I remember, I think it was Joe Stebrick who was talking about people driving around feeling really good about their, their Priuses. And the and, batteries are like... Well, the batteries and, and, and how much petroleum it takes to make each of the tires and the dashboard and everything else. Like, it would blow your mind how many barrels of oil you're consuming by, by and I think, in that car. But you're, but you're saving on the back end, so it's... But are you... So, so but don't, what we talk about is... Don't put the blinders on. Are you... And it's really difficult because I don't think that anybody really has the data or can calculate um, that energy, that mm -hmm. inherent energy consumption. And so, yeah, it is interesting. Like, are we are we moving the energy chess pieces around the board, but we're not really we're not really gaining, we're not really losing. You know what I mean? Like, are we just are we doing things that feel good and aren't necessarily um, solving some issues? Well, mm -hmm. residential building, or residential housing is not is like such a small portion of that pie of energy usage of the country. It's commercial and it's transportation. That's yeah, we talk about industrial. That's where all the money is. That's where all the energy is going. That's where, yeah, where, I, where, we're, where we're blowing it out and, and using yeah, too much. I, I think about that. I, it, I think it gets a little, I think it's a little bit heady maybe where, yes, maybe the residential um, share of energy consumption globally is um, dwarfed by, um, commercial, but I think there's something more personal about our homes 
and I think it informs our perceptions and the way we live and our values. And so if we make modifications there, I think that trickles into other industries, whether it be automotive, commercial building, food production, yada, yada, yada. You know well, what I mean? And, so, and not only that, but if you're a residential builder, a residential architect, and not a commercial builder, a commercial architect, you don't work in automotive, then that's where you can make an impact. Exactly. For sure. So you can't just say, well, there, it's worse there, yeah. so I don't need to do anything. Yeah, so who cares? Let's, right. let's, uh, be, let's ignore um, yeah. what, we, what we do know. And mm -hmm. what, what yeah. we do know is that air sealing saves energy. Um, it's also where you put your, your values. Um, and like that's why it gets a little bit not political, but it's, um, you could build a small house and you could build it out of sticks, dirt, and rock and likely be uncomfortable and live a fringe lifestyle. And it's probably the most sustainable house that you could build because that thing will disintegrate within probably four months of you not living there anymore. Mm -hmm. But is that the way that you want to live? And is that the way you want other people to live? And so we've got these comfort factors that we've grown accustomed to. And comfort is something that a lot of performance arch uh, or performance architects and builders say is like a byproduct of efficiency measures. Mm -hmm. So you make an airtight house and you insulate it well and you don't get drafts. You don't get like these spikes in temperature and humidity is controlled and it's healthy. It's not air laden with pollen and dirt and road, you know, smog, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you could go for the pure energy route. And sure, you could put, you know, a boatload of foam under your slab, you could build really thick walls, you get to net zero energy status, and you could be producing as much energy as you're consuming and feel really good about yourself. I'm going to leave it to somebody else to say whether that's like, whether that's progress or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think what has been interesting is, um, is that he's not alone in asking this question. And we brought it up when Mike Maines was on the project or and, on, on the podcast. And when Martin Holiday was here. And when also. Martin Holiday was here. And it's really the underlying, though it wasn't labeled as such, it is the premise of our pro home project where it is this pretty good house approach to building um, where it's not really that extreme. I mean, they're, they're relatively conventional walls. Granted on the pro home project, we took an advanced framing approach, but it's really a two by wall with some exterior insulation, some caulk and gaskets, you know, and then yeah, a, sm a very small heating system and right. ventilation there's and two, you're good to there's, go. There's two homes in the house is issue right, that's on the newsstand right now. I don't know, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if not, it just Every came week. off the newsstand. But there's two homes in there that are um, energy producers. They're producing more energy than they're consuming. Same thing. Yeah. Two by six walls, cellulose insulation, yeah. just, just enough insulation on the outside and, and the right air ceiling. And techniques. that's not, and he's saying, uh, and yeah, you have to ventilate them yeah. and you need power ventilation, but that's, there's no, we're, we're, we have to, well, his, well, he's making a good point. And definitely things like just building smaller, just consuming less are fundamental principles that are always going to work, always going to apply. You know, we also have to we have to keep in mind that we're not we can't go backwards. And there's something and this is where we're at. I think there's just something a little bit dangerous about this conversation is that, yes, the risk factors go up a little. They, they do go up based upon like a code build house. Actually, I'm going to totally refute that because <laughs> by my next point. Rob's arguing but, with but, but himself. We, but we talk about like, well, a leaky house can breathe and it could dry yes. and all that kind of stuff. But the materials that we're building houses with now today, which Justin has talked about, um, don't have the buffer capacities as the houses with board sheathing, for instance. They got, but a, what I, they got a glass jaw. But what I was going to say is that um, he's – there's like this assumption or this premise that this is like the Wild West. Nobody mm. really knows how this ha is working. Homes are failing. That's not true. Um, and I always give Martin, Martin Holiday credit to this because he's, he's been arguing these same points for 40 years. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's a record of performance. And yes, passive house has come to North America. Um, there's been, you know, lead has kind of propped up. And so there's these, been like these programs that have gained awareness. But this is not new. What we're talking about tight, air, airtight construction, well-insulated homes and properly vented homes is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. And it's a concept that you could execute and feel 
like you're on solid ground. And these <laughs> and these aren't the houses. High performance homes aren't the houses that have that caused the mold problems of the right. of the nineties. Right. They're, they're not. Those were spec houses. Those were builder builder production builder houses where they used materials wrong. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't the building scientists yep. and you know right. knowledgeable architects and builders houses that yeah that were failing. Yeah. Um yeah, and, and so t- t- to the point when um, – to circle back on that idea of, that I was going to refute about the risk factor being, mm-hmm. you know, high-performance house being riskier than a code-built house. I wanted to refute that because of the material. It's about, you know, OSB sheathing can't get wet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the, the mold explosion and that sort of thing. So what is the risk factor there, you know, to not air seal and to yeah. not kind of ventilate correctly and to not kind of design your wall assemblies – um, appropriately to manage not only energy but water, you know. I think it's riskier maybe to build that real basic builder budget bottom line house than it is to spend a little bit more more money and a little bit more effort into just improving the the, the building science approach to it. Basic builder budget bottom line. I'm just trying to like I'm just trying to describe <laughs> like because it's not code built. I mean, I think a code built house could still be a good house. Yeah, and I. You know, I think people throw around the term like, what is the a code built house is the worst house you could legally build. Yeah. All right. But there's <laughs> there's there's other there's also a um there's probably like really smart and caring builders who just build a really tight code built house too and are not skimping and are not botching the flashing details. You know what I mean? Well none of none of us here have ever lived in a really <laughs> nice house by those standards. No, my house is and we're, poorly framed. And we're mine's <laughs> poorly built. Mine's <laughs> totally poorly insulated. I'm still not sure that that bird oh, that yeah. came in didn't come through the sheathing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to aim for better. Yeah, there's no we, way. We understand how to do it better, and the materials that we're working with can't tolerate us doing it the way we've been doing it. So whether you want to change or not, it really comes down to whether you want your house to fail or not. I mean, I, under, I understand this, the, the fear factor of it. What he says really rings true. That the more I learn about insulation and air sealing, the less I think I know or understand it. That's, that's totally common. It's scary. I mean, we have that here. We've been doing this for a long time, and it's you start adding layers, and you go, wait, is that a problem? Is this going to interact with that? And, mm-hmm. you know, it's – but you just stick with assemblies that are proven. That's all you have to do, just, you know – don't don't overthink it. Just and there's a lot of. I mean, it's, we, we we tend to publish and talk about a lot of kind of fringy examples of really creative guys who know the science and are doing incredible things. But a two by six wall with cellulose, regular sheathing, house wrap or rigid foam or whatever you want on the outside, yeah, you're and good. you're done. Yeah. And it's and it's gonna be great. And I think um, maybe we foster that anxiety a little bit because I think. I think we do too. At least I've seen the magazine as a conduit for a conversation that's happening in the industry. And so when we see a wall assembly, we're going to cover it because it's interesting and there's learning involved. Mm -hmm. What fine home building isn't really is a manual where we kind of filter everything and then put our kind of flag in the ground and say, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the year, you will see a bunch of different types of wall assemblies that are working for very particular people and for very particular reasons. And we want to kind of share that and have that conversation about what's appropriate, what's not. But I think it, it's information overload, really. Mm-hmm. And so I think that heightens the anxiety of like, well, should I be doing a Larson truss here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or should I just be sticking to the two by six wall? Or should I be doing a double stud wall or whatever it is? Um, but yeah, like the, the wall assembly that Justin just mentioned is like, should be the new standard, essentially. And as far as I'm concerned, it sort of is. I mean, the, the, minus the rigid foam on the outside, people are not fully onto that yet. But it's they're finding. I guess it depends where you live. In some places, you can't get enough insulation into the wall, so it becomes the next logical step. But I mean, maybe maybe the problem there is that we have not yet seen a company who's really worked out the details to make that super simple for us. Like rigid foam, we, we know the workarounds for installing rigid foam on the outside of your house or mineral wool or whatever you want to use, depending on your sensitivity to environmental issues. But we've figured out how to adapt those products to that circumstance. And there's not really too many companies, and besides maybe some fringy ones, that have come up with just like a zip system kind of thing where it's like 
hey, we figured this all out for you. Just put the product up, and now it works with your conventional way of building. Like, I think I see what you're saying. You know, if somebody, if if a huge company like Dow or Owens Corning said introducing this new rigid foam available in X number of thicknesses that that leave you know, that have uh, internal stud systems or something like an ICF block does so that you can fasten your siding right to it. Some, I know that there are products like that. Well, I guess... But the, you see what I mean? Uh, well, I guess because there's no, like, one manufacturer of a wall. They're all, like, these right. disparate organizations and companies that have their own interests and want to position their product in a nuanced, specific way. Huber, again, we mentioned, is, like, they are... They have taken sheathing to another level. And now they're taking, they're layering in that rigid foam and the insulation component to it. But, you know, they'll have assemblies and, and, and maybe suggested details. I haven't gone through all of their literature, but they're not talking about studs and anything inboard of that, mm-hmm. you know. And the same is true of other, um, you know, maybe on the insulation front, everyone's going to be jockeying for that prime position with an insulation, that their insulation material and their product is the best. You know what I mean? And so the interests are... Sometimes questionable, mm-hmm. right? Like, is it in the best interest of building science and of the end consumer, or is it market share? You know what I mean. And end consumer mm-hmm. market share, Brian. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Where what are those? We're losing lie? Rob. We're losing Rob by the day here. <laughs> Sliding further and further into that world. Vertical integration, What's the bottom line, Rob? synergy. What's the bottom line? How we're going to measure success is what I want to know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the most important question. We right? got. We got to capitalize. Um, whatever this the uh, synergy is that we're building here, though, don't you think? You should. You should Momentum. T- you should tighten up the business model of this podcast pretty quick. For the end user. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about something else. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> Brad's ready. Wait, hold on a second. Brian, I don't think you said too, too much about this topic, about, about the question that we just had, because mm-hmm. uh, um, well, what do you think? Who's hosting this show? I am. Okay, I like that. Uh, what do I think about what he about that? Yeah, feedback? like yeah. Is it is it or should we should we go back to the good old days? The, well, no, air that, quotes. Good old days. Yeah. Whatever. And that was the that was sort of what I mentioned. Like we we can't go backwards, and we can't go back. We have, um, I think, we have at least. You know the way we, the way most of us live in this country, like you said, we have expectations of, um, of a certain level of comfort, and while we're while we continue to have that level, those expectations of what a home sh- is and should be, and that includes things like, particularly size, you know, um, I mean, and, and size is a big one. Yeah, size is a huge one. Yeah, take that. Um, we sh- we should talk about tiny houses. <laughs> yeah. Um, but while we have an expectation of that kind of, 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 of that, and then also in affordability and what a house should cost, um, then, you know, and now we, and now we know we have codes that tell us that we have to build to certain levels and we have codes that say that we have to use certain types of assembly, certain types of products. So a house has to be, has to have much more of, of a thermal, um, barrier than it ever did. It has to have a greater level of, um, air sealing than it ever did, right? There's a there's a threshold for yeah. for air leakage in the codes now. Um, it has to have certain things in terms of weather protection, like a weather barrier on the outside of the house. Once you once the codes start to say you have to have these things, then you have to know the science about how to use them right. So that's where we are. Yeah. And that science does get tricky and it does get, um, you know, it can get confusing, especially when we start to push it to greater levels and... We can definitely confuse people with the stuff that we publish in this magazine, um, like you guys both talked about. Um, but I also think it's not as complicated as maybe it sounds, as maybe he's making it out yeah. to be. And even and I don't think it's that risky either. Right. I think we've and I think you're, you're we're seeing more and more a, a, a standard way of of doing things that gets us where we need to go, which is you know to zero energy. Uh, eventually, because you know, to Justin's point about the the Prius and, and, and embodied energy and that kind of thing, yeah, that 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 is all. As long as we're as long as we're connected to the grid as it exists, yeah, building a building you know a, a low energy house or a zero energy house, or whatever, it might not have the impact mm-hmm. that we think 
it it's going to have. But if we ever get to a you know a place of renewable energies, then all of a sudden, very quickly, those houses do. Yeah, every one of them does have that impact that we wanted to have. Yeah, we got so a, we got a letter. That's the we just got a letter today. We had Kevin on recently talking about the uh, his article in the houses issue about why don't we build better houses, and we had we continue to get letters from people who are why should I bother with a net zero thing? And like, look, I mean, so don't bother with it if you don't want to do it. It's not like we're we all live in net zero houses and we're preaching right. from our uh, from like uh, the ivory tower here, but it's, it's like, how do you not get that? He's like, I pay one hundred and twenty five dollars a month in utilities, and I'm, so why should I ever go net zero? And it's like, well, so you don't have to pay anything. Like, but it's what? also a value. It's, <laughs> it's, also, it's a value. It's, 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 it's values. Like right. he, he doesn't care that he has low energy bills because gas is cheap right now. Right. Yeah. But somebody else might think like, well, I don't like the gas business and I want exactly. to sever my, you know, but, dependence mm-hmm. on it. Yeah. So, so it's just where you put your, your stock and nothing is yeah, I guess I just don't, right or wrong. But I guess I just don't see the point of the letter at that point, you know, when somebody says that to us, like, okay. You might then, not be considering it. Then don't do that. Like, what? Well, it's okay. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's. You it, and everybody else. Yeah. If it, it, if it, if it comes down to a financial equation then it's going to for some sometimes it's going to make sense sometimes things are going to make sense in some ec- economies with some types of products and some houses and other times they're not and if that's what you're basing your decision on how much you have to pay for your utilities and that and how much you have to pay to live in your house then you got to do the math and figure it out and make your decision if you're basing it on, on the fact that we're living as human beings in a pretty unsustainable way that our planet is warming and that we're creating an irreversible situation, an irreversible problem, then it's a different thing and finances become less important. Right. You know? Right. Science. Let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> it's going to throw that word out there, science. Yeah. What, is it, what, is, what does Neil deGrasse Tyson say? Science doesn't care, doesn't care whether you believe it. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I right. love that. <laughs> science. Bro, <laughs> just science. Just throw that word out. <laughs> science. Okay, let's. Uh, we got a question about vermiculite. Uh, Bill writes to us, "Hey guys, thanks for doing the podcast. It's great." Twelve years ago, my wife and I bought an 1890s farmhouse in Vermont where we live. It was a dump with good bones and lines, which I later found out is house inspector speak for you've got a bunch of work ahead of you. Anyway, we've done a great deal of renovation and love the place. When we first started, we were do-it-yourself cowboys, and while tearing down old drywall and exterior walls, I ran into vermiculite insulation. I didn't know what it was, so I sucked it all up in a standard shop vac and put it in a plastic garbage bag to get rid of it. <laughs> Sounds like something Justin and I worked on yeah, well, Justin and I worked yeah, one we'll, time. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, later, of course, I found out that this is not a good idea. Also something Brian and I later discovered. Uh, I can't do anything about what's already been done, but moving forward, older and smarter, more aware, and now with a young child, what should I do when I run into it again? Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. You guys know? <laughs> I, I know certain walls still have some of it. Some, if not quite a bit. I also know that renovations prior to ours removed some of it, etc. Um, but he's wondering, when I hire tradespeople like plumbers and electricians for jobs, I tell them about it, and it doesn't seem to bother them. I know they'll just... <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I know they'll disturb it during the job, but will that put us at risk? Um, and uh, Bill goes on to say, it seems like there's two viewpoints when it comes to this stuff. It's either not a problem or according to abatement specialists, it's a big problem with lots of money involved. I know not all vermiculite contained asbestos, so I was going to leave it. I was going to have it tested. Um, but people tell me I can get false negatives and positives, whatever that means. So what would you guys do? So let me, the, the backstory here, Brian and I's experience, um, Brian was living at a place in Connecticut uh, that was sort of part of a compound. It was a, it was in a, it was like a in law suite kind of yeah, a place, but there was a big old house on the property. Yeah. and so Brian and I were working on that house. Brian was, in addition to exposing himself to vermiculite insulation, exposing himself to lead paint dust and whatever other toxins he could find. Going all out. Yeah, nice. it was a different Brian back then. Different Brian. An old house. <laughs> These are the effects of the exposure yeah. that we're seeing now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I had never seen vermiculite for that job. I didn't know what it was. We did were. You, did you know that it contained asbestos? I didn't know what vermiculite oh, okay. was. Yeah, we didn't know. Okay, we didn't because uh, I've known about ver- vermiculite, but I didn't actually know that it had. Well, so we it. were doing. I was replacing shingles, out exterior sidewall shingles, and peel off the shingles, and then sometimes there was some rot. So you'd replace those pieces of board sheathing, and I took a piece of board sheathing off and just 
like an, a waterfall of insulation poured out of the wall, out like of the as wall. if you spilled a box of cereal. Like that's what the consistency of it yeah. is. Like, you know, I don't know, like kitty litter. It's kind of like kitty litter. Yeah. Um, just dumping out all of this over, wall yeah. cavity. You you open a board at the bottom and it's all it's just yeah, yeah. that's it waterfall. So we we just started bagging it up. And I think we stuffed fiberglass bats or something in there to replace it, but. Yeah, look at you guys. We were outside. Yeah, we <laughs> we were well ventilated. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, nice little breeze. You're fine. But we uh, should, by the way, we should have a big sort of X across that screen because that's making it look too good. Yeah, like yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. I want my attitude to sure. look like. I know. Well, that <laughs> fills all the <laughs> voids, nice and tight. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we have a Brian's joking. We have a picture up behind us that, I mean, the insulation must have been like the dream when it came out. You buy it in a bag. And the instructions for it are like pour it into the cavity, level it off, and you're done. Yeah, yeah like it's kind of heavy. It's not fluffy like fiberglass. Yeah, and it's what cellulose. it is. It's, it's like um, no it's like itch. you know, like mica when you peel off rocks when you were a little kid. It mm-hmm. sort of looks like that, except when they heat it up, it pops and like, and yeah. it kind of turns into this little puff of all different sizes. And we have a, a visual up here. It's you know, it can be any of these different sizes depending on the mix. Um, but the problem is that. 70% of it that was in production, and this was popular up through the pre, 60s, I think. I think pre-1980s, you could um, and assume that any vermiculite. And all, almost all of it in the country came from the same place in Montana, which was totally laced with, like, the worst kind of asbestos that you can get. And we'll get into that cover-up in a minute and how ridiculous that was. But um, essentially... Uh, you need to treat it like it's dangerous. That's that's the that's I, kind of the rule of thumb. Is t- he, if you have vermiculite, you should assume that it comes from this mine because most of it does. Yeah, you should assume. Um, I don't know if you were. We've got a couple of articles and links we could post on the site from GBA, um, one from Martin and one from Allison Bales. Um, that if you have vermiculite, just assume that it has asbestos in it. Yep. So don't even bother with the testing because, yeah, the false negatives and false positives, whatever it is, just eliminate that. Assume you've got asbestos and proceed accordingly, which is don't touch it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's either don't touch it and disturb it or yeah. if you're going to touch it and disturb it, have it abated. You know, yeah, have yeah. A, and it's yeah. the same asbestos abatement. Contractors can get it out for you. And we have a photo, uh, you know, I dug up a photo online of the basically they're coming in with a giant hose and it sucking out. it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and collecting it for you. But – um, it, it, I, I get, I get where Bill's coming from. I mean, you get to this point where like, yeah, I want to add a light switch. I am not going to, now I got to spend all this money yeah. to have all the vermiculite removed in my house. And I know I it's easy know. to say, uh, it's so, not yeah. that big of a deal, but I don't know. I mean, you got a little kid. That's a, that's, yeah. So the, I mean, the, the, the scoop with this stuff, just, just so you understand, sorry, Brian, you were, like you were I was just going to ask if it was used as a retrofit insulation. Cause I imagine in the house that we yeah. were working on, it was dumped into those walls. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of what the, yes. Okay. It was, and often you'll find it in old houses underneath another layer of insulation too, like okay. in the attic, but it was just super easy to install. It's just yeah. like, imagine you don't have to stop for insulation. You just frame the whole house and then worry about insulation yeah. after. Um, but uh, I'm sorry. I was just looking for this little blurb that. By the Libby mine? Uh, no, the, the um, yeah, this one. Uh, tremolite. I was looking for that name. Tremolite is is what why it was um, particularly dangerous around Libby because that's the vermiculite deposit there was Libby. laced with this tremolite, which is the most toxic form of asbestos. And it's essentially like the the description. Of this is what kind of got me gnarled out. Is its long fibers are barbed like fish hooks. They work their way into soft lung tissue and they never come out. Doesn't sound too good. So yeah, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Brian and I still have some in there. Um, yeah, I bet. But no, this is the part that I think a lot of people don't know, and it, it, frankly, it really kind of pisses me off and and makes Justin's me never want. Pissed, Brian. You hear that? Did you know about this, Brian? That that this that that mine was owned and operated by W R Grace, the same company that mm. makes Grace peel and stick flashing, Grace mm. underlayment for roofs. Ready for the letters. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that people are going to be pissed that I'm going down this road. But go down it. But I mean, permission granted. I, when I found out about this, <laughs> when I found out about this, and I like like to grace products, they were nice and well made. And you're backtracking, and I, it makes me never want to buy their stuff again. Just what are we talking about? <laughs> Tell them what we're talking about. Um, they 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 knew the grace company knew that this mine was a problem. They bought it, 
and they... What year is this? Oh, God, I have to... You better be heavy with the facts. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put the link up to this article that, that I'm, oh. there's, there's a lot of articles about it. Oh, no. Um, to the Inquirer. But... <laughs> You're such a pain in the ass, Rob. Is this fake news? Is this, this is, fake news? It's not fake news. Brian, hit him with the science. <laughs> um, in January 1963, Zonolite, which is what the company that sold this insulation was called, sold out to W.R. Grace. Early the following month, Grace executive P.L. Veltman wrote a letter indicating not only that asbestos was present in the vermiculite compound mined at Libby, but that the company was already looking for ways to market the stuff. So, hey, we got asbestos here. How are we going to sell this stuff? And they covered it up for decades. Like, And this whole town is destroyed at this point. Like people that... Because this stuff is fun so dusty. Mm-hmm. Like, and the workers would be covered. They, they said they were working in these dry mill areas where... It was just dust. Like you couldn't even see your hands on the broom in front of you. It was so dusty. And that's not even having, that's not even uh, talking about the people that just lived in the town because the dust would get in the air. And if you had, and then the wind would just blow it and everything in the town had this white coating on it. And so now decades later, there's tons of people with lung problems and terrible cancers and, and the company is like, it's seemingly largely gotten off the hook for it, even though they knowingly just said like, F you to the whole thing and the whole town and and knowingly just sold this product to the entire country is f- pretty much for as long as they could get away with it. When did Which that, is just like when did know. that mine and when did that whole deal get shut down? Eighties, uh, nineties? <clears throat> um, I don't remember now. Why do you have to ask me questions I don't know the answer to? The hard hitting ones? <laughs> the hard hitting ones. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Mm, good. People are still dying. That's all you need to know, Rob. Okay. Um, so, yeah, take this stuff seriously. Uh, okay. Until the mid-1970s, it was mined in Libby. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was just the dry mill. I don't know, Rob. Jeff, we're going to have to edit this whole thing out of here now. Rob's making calling call me out on facts I don't know the answers to. Um, but it, uh, you're, you're right. It's a super fun site <clears> now. <throat> um, Cheap hotel rates. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't joke about that. Yeah, well, we got hammered on the lead paint conversation. Yeah, so no, no laughing about well, so vermiculite. Let's, so let's no be laughing clear. about vermiculite. Yeah, to be clear, so let's be clear. That we are go. very yes. serious about vermiculite. Yes. You should take it very seriously. Yes. Agree. Justin and I were foolish, and yeah, we were just idiots. Didn't, we didn't know. We didn't know any and better. If you don't know, we were the cowboy yeah, remodelers. Like we were the this cowboy guy remodelers. Was. Yes. Yeah. If you don't know, you can do some really dangerous things. So try to know. And I'm sure that in the initial moments of it pouring out, it's like. You think it's like a squirrel nest or something because it's like, what is this stuff? And then it keeps going. You're like, oh, this is purposeful. Did you put your hands in it like it was a like a waterfall? It's a really – like I imagine yeah, – you, you got in there. I imagine the people buying it like – you're like, yeah, this makes so much sense. And it seems, I just saw <laughs> – yeah. we had a little uh, uh, package of – what was it called? Zano, Zano Light. Zano Light, and it's fireproof and self-leveling. Yeah. They market it as the safe insulation. No itch, free-flowing. Yeah, it seems like a it's like a, and I wonder, a good you know, product. To be honest, I wonder what toxic. I, I'm curious what maybe we not knowing that when we pulled off a sheathing board that this insulation was gonna dump out of the wall, I do wonder what the thing to do would have been once that happened. And now you're on a roof yeah. and you have a pile of vermiculite laying on the roof. Do you throw a tarp over it and then maybe. call a contractor? What's yeah, the move yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. Um certainly put know. on a respirator immediately. Yeah. And Probably you know get out of there. shower before you Get back in the car. It was so hot. I remember that job was so hot. Yeah. It was probably just sticking to us. Oof. That doesn't sound good. I'm blaming all my health problems today on that. That's all I'm saying about that. Dave writes to us, my sister recently bought a 1980s house in Bucks County outside of Philadelphia, and there appears to be an open pipe attached to an S-trap that connects into the drain line right before it leaves the house. I've never seen this before, and it seems that it would allow sewer gases back into the house. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Any ideas about what the, what purpose this drain serves? Is it just a leftover? Um, the house is on a septic system. Thanks, and keep up the great work with the podcast. Look forward to it every week. That's weird. So we have a photo of this. You can check out the show notes, findhomebuddy.com slash podcast, or if you're watching the video version, it's on the screen right here. Um, this is uh, this is what I would like to call a shit show. Yeah. <laughs> You need, to, you need to fix this immediately. I think what it was is a standpipe for some piece of – some condensate tube like from a refrigerator or ice maker or something else. Oh, really? So basically for people who don't get what we're seeing here is uh, 
it's essentially like the trap that's underneath your sink, except it's just open at the top. And is that the main? It just that, goes nowhere. So that's the main vent, though, going up and through, or what? What? what what's going up through the is floor system? Is that continue up, or is that capped? That's what I'm wondering. I think that's that's a transition. That's a transition to some black. Yeah. The other thing that PVC. we're that we're not noting here is that there's this is a mixture going from PVC to ABS and back to PVC and back to ABS. Very <laughs> colorful. Very colorful. Which you can't oh, do, by I... the way. That's not. You can't do that. Not cool. You're allowed to switch one time from PVC to ABS, or vice versa, and you have to use a transition cement, which is a green colored solvent weld plumbing cement you can't just willy-nilly decide to go back and forth because they they're not compatible in that way mm -hmm. um i think the easiest solution here is to throw an air admittance valve on the top of that open top of that pipe and uh here's a, here i can show you here brian i got the, the zoomed in version well, of it, it if you want to see instead of just capping it completely I, well because i'm guessing that sorry i should have clarified one of two things that i can come up with for why this was added one would be as some sort of a vacuum break, like like they're trying to get more air, like this is supposed to be some sort of a vent thing to help something, or they had something going into this. And if they have no need for it, I would just call stick one of those air AAVs on top, which is a special valve that you can put on top of. Uh, on the open part that on the part that's open right now, yeah. above the. So would you fill the would you fill the trap with water? No, it wouldn't matter. It just wouldn't matter. just keep. Sewer gases. That's what the AAV up. is going to do. Yeah. Oh, because it only lets air admittance valve airflow. has like a rubber right. diaphragm inside, so it will allow air in. So you can. Right. It can sometimes serve in certain jurisdictions of the country, whether you're allowed to use it. Blah blah blah. Yeah. You could use this thing instead of running a new vent pipe. Like yes. if you're um, venting your sink for your kitchen island, and you can't run a pipe up to the ceiling because it's an island, you can do some crazy. Some crazy workaround plumbing, or you can just stick one of these things on there. I have, mm -hmm. I have a bunch of these in my house. <laughs> Whether I'm allowed to or not, I don't know. Um, but you can get them at the hardware store. Air admittance valve. Rob, Rob doesn't like it. He looks skeptical. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess it would work. I mean, if it's serving it could, no purpose, you could be close all the you time. You could cut into it and just remove it and, and make that vent pipe go straight up. Yeah. But right. Yeah. it's going to be faster. Just stick an AAV on there. Um, but if you tried to use it as a trap, Brian, anytime you flushed a toilet or, or there's a chance that water rushing past, that's going to siphon off that, that so trap. I, I didn't realize that air it's, mittens valves were a one way. It's also just yeah. a one way valve. Evaporate. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That's true too. Yeah. It's not going to be in there long. Nope. Ain't going to be in there long guys. What's, All going, right. on, what's going on at that room joist? We need some air sealing work oh, over there. Are we, no, we're not getting off of the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> I just had um, to get air sealing, uh, into the episode again. So that's yeah. good. <laughs> Science. Sure. I would check. <laughs> also, when you're when you're fitting that AAV, make sure your attic is ventilated properly. Science, that's folks. gonna <laughs> that's gonna wrap up the show for this week. Uh, next week, um, we're gonna have a special guest, um, Ooh, Mr. Brent Brent Hull, the hockey player, the host. No, not the hockey player. <laughs> host of the History Channel show Lone Star Restoration, um, and a longtime well, fine home building contributor. He's he goes back in the history of the magazine. Yeah, um, sure. we're, we're I'm hoping it'll be next week. We're working out some dates right now. Um, we're aiming for next week, though, and we're hoping to have him on as possibly as a video interview. So, and he's he's really a wealth of knowledge when it comes to historic. Oh yeah, he's details, it, historic millwork, historic architecture. Yeah, he's yeah. he's gonna be an interesting guy to talk to about, and, and he's in uh, well, Lone Star State, so it's a whole different vibe from what we're used to here. I think we'll talk about air sealing. We're probably not gonna talk <laughs> about air sealing. <laughs> uh, if you have questions or top, are you texting right now, Rob? I'm late for a meeting, so I'm just letting him oh. know that I'll be there soon. So important. If you have questions or topics you'd like to hear us text to Rob on an upcoming show, shoot us an email, fhppodcast at taunton.com. Also, if you like the show or didn't like the show, hop onto iTunes and share the love. Give us a rating review. It's a grassroots effort. We'd like to hear from you. And uh, send us your stickers. Okay. Until next time, this is Justin for Brian and Rob saying happy building. <laughs> <laughs>